So let V be a finite dimensional vector space with the basis, let's say the dimension of V is N with basis E1, E2 up to E sub N. So this is an ordered basis for the vector space V. Let W be another finite dimensional vector space. Let's say the dimension of W is M with basis F1 up to F sub M. M and M can be the same or they can be different. And suppose we have a function T from V to W, the T be a linear transformation. So that's a special kind of function between vector spaces. That means it has the property that T of V1 plus V2 is T of V1 plus T of V2 for all vectors V1, V2, and V. And T of C times V is C T of V for all vectors V and V and C in the field F, C is a scalar. So a linear transformation from one vector space to another is a function that satisfies these two fundamental properties. These are very, very, very important. And every linear transformation between finite dimensional vector spaces can be represented by a matrix. And the way we do this is as follows. So for every J from one up to N, E sub J is a basis vector for V. So T of E J is in W because T maps V to W. And so T of E J is some linear combination of the basis vectors in W. This is summation, say, A, I, J, F sub I. I goes from one up to M. And so as J goes from one to N and I goes from one to M, we have this, these numbers, these scalars. And let A, Aij be the M by N matrix. So I goes from one to M, J goes from one to N, that defines a matrix A. And what is the connection between the matrix A and the linear transformation T? So again, T of EJ is summation AIJ F sub I, I goes from one up to M for all J between one and N. Again, we always have this picture. Here's V, here's W, and T is a function from V to W. Suppose we let V be a vector in V. So then <clears throat> V is some linear combination of the basis vectors, summation xj, ej, j equal one up to n. The ejs are a form a basis for the vector space V. So the coordinates x sub j are unique and we have the coordinate vector With V with respect to this basis, then we call it E. It's just the vector x1, x2, down to x sub n. 
<clears throat> and suppose we let, we have T of V is a vector in W. So T of V is some summation Y I F I, I goes from one up to M and the coordinate vector for T of V with respect to this basis F for W is the vector y1, y2, down to y sub m. So I'm going to show you the relationship between these two coordinate vectors. This is in Rn, or Fn. This is in Fm. What is the relation? Well, it can go as follows. You see, what is T of v? T of v is T of summation x, j, e, j. j goes from 1 up to n, because v is equal to this vector. Because t is a linear transformation, this is summation, j goes from 1 up to n, x sub j, t of e sub j. This is t of e sub j. Summation, j goes from 1 up to n, x sub j, T of EJ is summation I goes from 1 up to M AIJ F sub I. <clears throat> we can interchange finite summations. This is summation I goes from 1 up to M. Summation J goes from 1 to N AIJ X sub J F sub I. So here I've written T of V as a linear combination of the Fs, and these are the coordinates. So if I look at the coordinate vector for T of V with respect to F, that is, these are the coordinates. Summation A1J XJ, summation A2J XJ, down to summation a M J X J J goes from one to N in all these sums. Now, <clears throat> if you take the matrix A times the vector X one, well, let me do it like this, that more space. I take the matrix A, this is an M by N matrix, times the vector, the coordinate vector for X with respect to E, which is an N by one matrix. So this product is M by one. What is this? This is the matrix A, A11 up to A1N, AM1 up to AMN, applied to the vector X1 down to Xn. And when you perform this matrix multiplication, the first coordinate is summation A1JXJ. J goes from one up to N. The second coordinate is summation A2JXJ. J goes from one up to N. All the way down to the nth coordinate, which is summation, <clears throat> the nth coordinate, A sub mj x sub j, j goes from 1 up to n, which is exactly the coordinate vector for t of v with respect to f. So we come to this following very beautiful theorem. If you take this matrix A that I defined, the matrix with re of the linear transformation with respect to the bases E and F, A applied to the coordinate vector of E you just do ordinary matrix multiplication. This is the coordinate vector T of V with respect to F. So this formula, if you understand what all the symbols mean, 
is explains how you can represent a linear transformation by a matrix. You have a linear transformation of finite dimensional vector spaces. You fix bases E and F for the vector spaces. You look at this matrix A, which comes from, again, how do we get A? A, we have that <clears throat> T of the vector EJ is summation AI J F sub I. I goes from one up to M. This is how you get the coordinates of this matrix. And <clears throat> if you look at this matrix, let's see, let's see, what is the Jth column? I have A1J, A2J, down to AMJ. Right? This is a1j f1, a2j f2, a3j f3, to amj fm. The jth column of the matrix is the coordinate vector for t of ej. So Ej is the jth vector in the basis E. T of Ej, if you look at the coordinate vector for that, that's exactly A1j, A2j, down to Amj, which is, in fact, the jth column of the matrix A. So when you look at your matrix A, each column tells you where each basis vector gets mapped to, okay. so, so that's a very, very, very important fact about what the numbers in the matrix for a linear transformation mean. And let me give an example of how this can be used. There was a previous homework problem that looked at what are called strictly upper triangular matrices. So let A be an N by N strictly upper triangular matrix. So this is a matrix where all the numbers on and below the main diagonal are zero, it's only in the upper triangle that you might have a non-zero coordinate. So for n equal two, your matrix would have zeros on the diagonal and below, and the only unrestricted coordinate is the number here, which is A12. That's what a strictly upper triangular two by two matrix looks like. For n equal three, you have zeros down the main diagonal and below, and it's only these entries, A12, A13, A23. They could be zero, but they can be anything. They could be non-zero. If N is equal to four, the strictly upper triangular matrix has four zeros down the diagonal and below the diagonal are all zeros. And it's only in this upper triangle, A12, A13, A14, A23, A24, A34. These are the only numbers that might be non-zero. So this is the main diagonal. On and below that main diagonal, everything is zero. And it's only in this little triangle above the main diagonal where you could have a non-zero element. Okay. Let's look at this matrix, for example. Zeros, so that A, so call this matrix A. So 
So every three by three matrix represents a linear transformation from the three-dimensional vector space to itself with respect to some fixed bases for those vector spaces. So let's say that this is A. And we have, so let's say A is the matrix for a linear transformation T from with respect to bases E and F. So A times the coordinate vector for V with respect to E gives you the coordinate vector for T of V with respect to F. So if you look at this matrix, A applied to the vector 1, 0, 0 is 0, 0, 0. The first column is the coordinates of the basis vector E1. A applied to 0, 1, 0 is A1, 2, 0, 0. A applied to the third basis vector is the third column, A1, 3, A2, 3, 0. So what this says is, if you look at the corresponding linear transformation T, T of E1 is 0. T of E2 only has a first coordinate. It's in the subspace generated just by E1. T of E3, it's a vector where the third coordinate is 0, so it's in the subspace generated by E1 and E2. So T of E1 gets sent to 0. T of E2 is a multiple of E1. That means T squared of E2, which is T of E2, which is T of some multiple of E1 is zero. What about this? T squared of E3, if I apply T to E1, I get zero. If I apply T to E2, I get something in E1. This is in the subspace spanned by E1. So t cubed of E3, if I apply t to this, that's t of some scalar multiple of V1, that's zero. So for this three by three matrix, A cubed is zero. And there was a previous homework problem that says that if A is n by n strictly upper triangular, then A to the N must be the zero matrix. And the reason is that A sends the subspace spanned by, let's say, the first K vectors into the subspace spanned by just the first K minus one vectors. So as you iterate, this matrix multiplication looked at as a linear transformation, it's mapping the vector space into strictly smaller and smaller subspaces. And when you do it n times, it's zero. Okay. That is a very, very, very useful fact about linear transformations and matrices. It's very nice. So a great deal of linear algebra is spent studying linear transformations. And there are certain words associated or certain objects associated with a linear transformation. So let T from V to W be a linear transformation. So I claim T of zero is zero. Let me write this as a little lemma. If you apply T to the zero vector in V, you get the zero vector in W. 
just to emphasize this, I'm going to write a little subscript V and a subscript W. Take the zero vector in V, T of that is the zero vector in W. And the proof simply comes from the fact that zero is zero plus zero. So T of zero is T of zero plus zero. Because T is a linear transformation, this is T of zero plus T of zero. I don't know what this vector is yet, but it's a vector, so it has an additive inverse. So T of zero minus T of zero, take a vector and subtract it from itself, you get zero. This is some vector in W. So this minus this, the difference of two vectors in W that are the same is the zero vector in W. The T of zero V is T of zero plus T of zero. And I'm subtracting T of zero from that. And by associativity, that's T of the zero vector plus T of the zero vector minus T of the zero vector. But this is just zero. This is T of the zero vector plus the zero vector in W, which is T of the zero vector in V. So that kind of um, long equation is the proof of the statement that a linear transformation always sends a zero vector to the zero vector. And there's a second assertion, which is T of the vector minus V is the same as minus the vector t of v. Right? Why is that? So let me give a proof of the second statement. So <clears throat> t of v plus t of minus v, because t is a linear transformation, this is t of v plus minus v, but v minus v is zero. This is t of the zero vector in V, which is the zero vector in W. So this plus this is the zero vector in W. So T of minus V is minus T of V. That's the whole proof of this useful, but very simple level. So again, let's draw a picture. Here's V, here's W, and T is a linear transformation from V to W. So we have the zero vector in V, we have the zero vector in W, and zero gets mapped to zero. But of course, there can be more things that get mapped to zero. So what we call the kernel of T is the set of all vectors V and V such that T of V is zero. So this is everything that gets mapped to zero. And another very important, I'll call it a lemma, is that the kernel of T is a subspace of V. Proof. Well, we already saw the T of the zero vector is the zero vector. So the zero vector is in the kernel of T. So that's the first property of a subspace and it's satisfied. Second, if V1 and V2 are two vectors in the kernel of T, then T of V1 is zero and T of V2 is zero. So T of V1 equals T of V2 equals zero. So T of V1 plus V2, this is T of V1 plus t of v2, that's zero plus zero, which is zero. So therefore, v1 plus v2 is in the kernel of t. Okay. 
So that's the second property a subspace has to satisfy is closed under vector addition. And if V is in the kernel of T and C is any scalar, then T of C times V, because T is a linear transformation, T of CV is C T of V. But T of V is in the kernel. So T of V is zero. And any number times zero, the vector zero is the vector zero. So therefore CV is in the kernel of T. So the subspace, the kernel of T, all the vectors that get mapped to zero, contain zero, is closed under vector addition, is closed under scalar multiplication. Therefore, the kernel of T is a subspace of V. Now, there's also another set that's naturally associated with the linear transformation. Okay. Again, we have our picture. Here's V, here's W, here's a linear transformation T from V to W. The zero of V gets mapped to the zero in W. Now, <clears throat> Every vector v is mapped to some vector t of v and w. But it's not necessarily the case that every vector in w is the image of some vector in v. So, so the, that is defined the image of t is all vectors w in the vector space W, such that W equals T of V for some V in V. So over here in W is the subset of all the vectors which actually are the images in V. They have a pre-image. Something is in this red area of W, which is what I call the image of T, if there's a vector v such that t of v is in this red area. That's the image. And our lemma says that the image of t is a subspace of w. So again, what is the proof? We have that <clears throat> t of the zero vector in v is the zero vector in w. So the zero vector in W is certainly in the image of T. So the image of T contains zero. Second, if W1 is in the image of T, then W1 is equal to T of V1 if some V1 in V, that's the definition of the image. And if W2 is another vector in the image of T, then W2 is T of V2 for some V2 in V. So then we look at T applied to the vector V1 plus V2. By linearity, this is T of V1 plus T of V2. That's W1 plus W2. So W1 plus W2 is the image of the vector V1 plus V2. This is in the image of T. So the image of T is closed under vector addition. If W1 and W2 are any two vectors in the image, then their sum is also in the image. And third, if W1 is in the image, and W1 is T of V1, CW1, what is CW1? That's C times T of V1. But by linearity, because T is a linear transformation, this is T of CV1. 
this is a vector in V. So CW1 is in the image of T. So the image of T is also closed under scalar multiplication. And that proves our thing. So let's again look at this picture again. I like this picture. Here's V, here's W. Here is the zero vector in V. Here is the zero vector in W. Now sitting inside of V is the kernel. Let's call this K. The kernel of V, that's everything It gets mapped to zero. And sitting inside of W, so this is the kernel of T, and sitting inside of W is a subspace called the image of T. So I actually have now two vector spaces, V and W, and whenever I have a linear transformation T from V to W that defines a subspace of V, which is the kernel, and a subspace of W, which is the image of that linear transformation. Okay. And there is a relationship between these, which is the following. So suppose V be a finite dimensional vector space. So let's say the dimension of V is equal to N. Then, so this is a theorem. Then the kernel of T is a subspace of V and the image of T is a subspace of W. We know that was what we proved in the previous two lemmas. The theorem says that the dimension of the vector space V is the sum of the dimensions of the subspaces kernel of T plus the dimension of the subspace, the image of T. So this is really a very important theorem. It's one of the fundamental theorems in linear algebra. For finite dimensional subspaces, if you have a linear transformation T from V to W, the dimension of V is the dimension of the kernel plus the dimension of the image. And note, I didn't say anything about the dimension of W. Maybe W is infinite dimensional, but the image of T. <clears throat> so if... Um, So suppose we let E1 up to En be a basis for V. Let V be any vector in the vector space V. Say V is summation Xi EI. I goes from one up to N. So T of V is T of summation Xi EI which is summation xi t of ei. i goes from 1 up to n. So every vector in the image is of the form t of v, and t of v is a linear combination of these n vectors t of e1 up to t of en. T of V is a linear combination of these n vectors. So these vectors 
span the image of T. So some subset of them is a basis for the image of T because we proved that if you have a finite set of vectors that spans a subspace, there's a subset of that set, which is a basis for the subset, not only spans, but is linearly independent. So the dimension of T of V is at most, is the dimension of T of V, the dimension of the image of T is at most N the dimension of V. So that's just a point I want to emphasize at the beginning. <clears throat> so how can we prove this theorem? So we have V and sitting inside V is the kernel of T. So the kernel of T is a subspace of V suppose we left the dimension of the kernel of T be equal to K because every vector space has a basis. The kernel is the number of vectors in the basis. The a subspace has dimension less than or equal to the dimension of the larger space. So the if the dimension of the kernel of T is K, that's some number less than or equal to N, which is the dimension of V. So let E1 up to E sub K be a basis for the kernel of T. So we proved the lemma that is, we said the following, this is a theorem and we already proved. So this is, I'll say previous theorem. Um, let V be a finite dimensional vector space. Say the dimension of V is equal to N. Let E1 up to EK be a linearly independent subset of V. So K is at most N, because N is the size of the largest linearly independent subset of V. There exist vectors, EK plus one, EK plus two, up to EN, such that the set E1 up to EK, EK plus one, EK plus two, up to N, EN, is the basis for V. So we had proved in previous in previous chapter that every linearly independent subset of a vector space can be extended to a basis for the vector space. So let's apply that in this case. So this is a basis for the vector space V and the first K vectors, these are a basis for the kernel of T. So here we have a basis for V. <clears throat> e1 up to Ek is a basis for the kernel of T. And we've extended that to a basis 
who are the rest of thee? So let me. So we have this basis for the kernel of T, which is E1 up to EK. And then we extend to a basis for V, E1 up to EK. And then we have to add another n minus k vectors, e k plus 1, up to e sub n. So the total dimension of v is n. So here we have n minus k and additional vectors. So if we take any vector v in the vector space, v is some linear combination. i goes from, j goes from 1 to n x sub j, e sub j. So t of v is t of summation j goes from 1 to n, x j, e j, which is summation j goes from 1 to n, x j, t of e j, because t is a linear transformation. And I can write this as a sum of two sets of vectors. This is the vectors from 1 to k, plus the vectors from k plus 1 up to n. But if you look at these vectors, for j going from 1 to k, ej is in the kernel of t. So this vector is 0. So in fact, this, this sum is zero. We're just adding the zero vector to itself, k times. So this is just the sum xj, t of ej, j goes from k plus one to n. It's this vector in the image of t. Every vector in the image of t is t of v for some vector v in the vector space v. So this says that the image of T is spanned by this set of n minus k vectors. T of e j, k plus one less than or equal to j less than or equal to n. So the image of T is spanned by n minus k vectors. So the dimension of the image of T is at most n minus k. And I'm going to prove the dimension of the image of t is exactly n minus k. So these vectors span the image. I want to show that they are linearly independent. So suppose there exist scalars xk plus 1 up to x sub n, such that this linear combination, summation, x sub j, t of e sub j, j goes from k plus 1 up to n, is the zero vector. So we have the zero vector in w is summation xj t of ej, j goes from k plus 1 to n, which by linearity, because t is a linear transformation, this is t of summation xj ej, j goes from k plus 1 to n. But this means that this vector xj ej summed from k plus 1 to n is in the kernel of t. The kernel of t is the set of all vectors that t maps to zero. And the kernel of t has a basis e1 up to ek. So therefore, summation xj ej, j goes from k plus 1 to n, must be a vector of the form xj ej, j goes from 1 to k, which is the same as saying summation j goes from 1 to k, xj ej, 
plus summation, J goes from K plus one, and just bring this over to the other side, N minus XJ, EJ is zero. But E1 up to EN, that's a linearly independent set. Those vectors are linearly independent. So all the coefficients have to be zero. So XJ equals zero for all J from one up to N. So in particular, from K plus one up to N. So therefore the set of vectors T of EJ, J from K plus one to N is linearly independent. So a basis, we know they span the image of T. So they're a basis for the image of T. So we have that the dimension of the kernel of T is K. The dimension of the image of T is N minus K. So if we add the dimension of the kernel of T plus the dimension of the image of T is equal to N, K minus K cancel, which is the dimension of V. And that is the proof. <clears throat> now, there are lots of vocabulary words in linear algebra. <clears throat> the dimension of the image of T is sometimes called the rank of T. And the dimension of the kernel of T is sometimes called the nullity of T. So you often see this theorem stated as follows. For any linear transformation T, the nullity plus the rank is the dimension of the domain space V. But that is the proof of the theorem, which is a very important theorem in linear algebra and definitely something you will be asked to prove on the final exam. So you really need to invest time to understand the proof. Let's look at a couple of very simple examples of linear transformations and their kernels and images. So suppose we let V equal W B R two, and we look at a linear transformation from R2 to R2, and let's say it's the following, T of XY is the vector X0. So check that this is a truly linear transformation. That's an exercise for you. What is the kernel of this? What does this look like? So here we have a point x, y in the plane. That's my v. And it gets mapped to the point x0. That's my t of v. Oh, I should write this x, y, x0. So this is just projection onto the x-axis. So the image of t is the x-axis. And the dimension of the x-axis, that's just a one-dimensional space, the dimension of the image of t is one. So this red line, that's the image of t. And what is the kernel of t? t of x, y is zero, zero. If and only if, what is t of x, y? x, zero, zero, zero. If and only if, x equals zero. The line x equals zero is the y-axis. So the y-axis is the kernel of t. All the points they can project it onto zero vertically are the points on the y-axis. The image of t is the x-axis. And so the kernel of t, 
is the y-axis, which is a one-dimensional subspace. The dimension of the kernel of T is one. And the dimension of R2 is two. So <clears throat> the dimension of R2 is the dimension of the kernel of T plus the dimension of the image of T. That is two equals one plus one. Okay, so one plus one equal two is a <clears throat> nice result in linear algebra. Let's look at another example. Again, I'm going to restrict myself to the plane. <clears throat> so define <clears throat> T from R2 to R2 by T of X, Y is Y, X. So <clears throat> this linear transformation interchanges the coordinates. So if I have E1, which is one, zero, T of one, zero is zero, one. So T maps E1 to E2. T of zero, one, is zero, one, is one, zero. So T maps E2 back to E1. Hmm. Okay. For this map, what is the kernel of T? The kernel of, so XY is in the kernel of T if and only if t of x, y, which is y, x, is 0, 0, if and only if x equal y equals 0. So the kernel of t consists of just the 0 vector. And the dimension of the kernel of t is 0. What is the image of t? Well, for every vector x, y in R2, x, y is t of y, x. <clears throat> so every vector is in the image of t. The image of t is all of R2. So the dimension of the image of t is equal to 2. So the statement that Dimension of R2 is dimension of the kernel plus dimension of the image is just the statement 2 equals 0 plus 2. Okay, so that's a confirmation in this case. Let's look at a slightly more complicated linear transformation. Suppose we have T from R2 to R2 defined by T of X, Y is X plus 2 Y 2 X plus 4y. So what is the kernel? So xy is in the kernel of t, if and only if t of xy is the zero vector, which is t of xy is this, if and only if x plus 2y, 2x plus 4y is the zero vector. So if and only if x and y are solutions of the equations x plus 2y uh, equals 0, 
2x plus 4y equals 0. And this is the same the saying, if and only if, the, only, the solutions of that equation, there are infinitely many, x equals minus 2y. So if and only if the vector xy is minus 2yy, or y times the vector minus 2, 1. So the kernel of t is the set of all scalar multiples of the vector minus 2, 1. So the dimension of the kernel of t is 1. This is a one-dimensional vector space. It's all scalar multiples of this one non-zero vector. So let's draw a picture. The kernel is all vectors where x equals minus 2y, or if you like, y equals minus a half x. That's a line through the origin, the slope minus a half. So this line is the kernel of t. Something gets mapped to zero if and only if it's on this line. What is the image of t? It's the set of all vectors of the form t of x, y, for x, y in R2. That's all vectors of the form x plus 2y, 2x plus 4y. for all x and y in R2. <coughs> but I can write this as follows. Um, this is, I can factor out x plus 2y times the vector <coughs> 1, 2. <coughs> this is x plus 2y, and this is 2 times x plus 2y. So it's all scalar multiples, 1, 2, by numbers of this form, which is just all numbers. Um, this is a set of all x times 1, 2 for all x and r2. So the dimension <clears throat> of the image of T is also one. And so our theorem again comes down to the fact that one plus one equals two. The set of scalar multiples of the vector one, two, there's the vector one, two. It's just this blue line. This blue line is the image of T. So every vector gets mapped to something on the blue line, and every vector on the red line gets mapped to zero. Okay. So there's examples of Computing the kernel in the image, it's very important. Let me make uh, just a couple of other quick remarks. Suppose T from V to W is a linear transformation. And suppose we let K be the kernel of T. So let V1 and V2 be in V. So T of V1 equals T of V2, if and only if T of V2 minus T of V1 is zero, which is the same as saying V2 minus V1 gets mapped to zero. So if and only if V2 minus V1 is in the kernel of T. Okay. 
So if the kernel of t is just the zero vector, then t of v1 equals t of v2. If and only if v2 minus v1 is zero, or if and only if v1 equals v2. So such a function is called one-to-one. -one. T is one-to-one -one in this case. What this means is here is V, here is W. T is mapping from V to W. V1 and V2 are two vectors in V. If they get mapped to exactly the same point, then in fact, they have to be the same vector. So if the kernel of T is zero, then any two different vectors must be mapped to two different vectors in W. That's not the case if the kernel of T is non-zero, because in that case, there's some vector in the kernel of T different from zero, and it as well as zero gets mapped to zero. So a function that maps different elements to different elements is called one-to-one. -one. So we have a theorem that says T is one-to-one -one if and only if the kernel of T consists of just the zero vector. So that is a useful fact about linear transformations. There are two other linear transformations that are very important because they're basic and they're actually kind of simple. So, so let's consider R2 and a function from R2 to R2, a linear transformation. Um, Let me call this R sub alpha. Alpha is an angle. So if you take a vector V in the plane, R alpha rotates that vector by alpha radians. So this is rotation around the origin by alpha radians, right? We always use radian measure. 2 pi is equivalent to what you would used to call 360 degrees. And rotation is a linear transformation. What is the matrix for the rotation function? Let's see. If we take the unit vector E1, this is the unit circle. If it's rotated by an amount alpha, it gets sent to this point, and this is cosine alpha, sine alpha, right? So you have to remember elementary trig. If you take the unit vector, rotated alpha radians around the circle, this is actually the definition of cosine and sine. So this rotation R alpha of the vector one zero is the vector cosine alpha, sine alpha. If you take the other basis vector, 0, 1, E2 equals 0, 1, you rotate this alpha radians around the circle, and the cosine and the coordinates of this point are sine alpha minus cosine alpha. So R alpha of zero one is sine alpha minus cosine alpha. So the matrix for rotation by alpha is cosine alpha sine alpha 
oops, I'm sorry. This is minus sine alpha. It's negative plus cos minus sine alpha, cosine alpha. And the determinant of this matrix is cosine squared alpha plus sine squared alpha equals one. So if you have rotation by alpha radians around the unit circle, that's a linear transformation with this matrix. There's another geometrically very simple and important linear transformation in the plane, which is the following. Instead of a rotation, we can look at a reflection. So in the plane, here's the line L alpha. It's the straight line that makes an alpha makes an angle alpha with the positive x axis. And S alpha is going to be reflection through the line L alpha. What that means is if you take a vector x, y, you draw the perpendicular to this line and then continue the same distance on the other side. And this is S alpha of x, y. So you take your vector and you reflect it through that line. How can we work out the matrix for this? So this remember some high school geometry. Here we have a right triangle. Here we have a right triangle. They have the same side here, and these two sides are the same. So these are congruent triangles. Let's see. Let me call this actually, let me call this x, y, and this is reflection, so the picture is easier. Suppose this angle is theta from the origin to my vector. So this vector has polar coordinates, r theta. This is theta. This is alpha minus theta. This is alpha minus theta. So when you reflect, s of x, y has polar coordinates. The distance to the origin hasn't changed, but the angle, instead of being theta, is alpha plus alpha minus theta is two alpha minus theta. So let me draw a better picture of this. I'm reflecting through this line L alpha. So this angle is alpha. And I take my vector V, whose polar coordinates are going to be R theta. That means this distance is R and this angle is theta. And when I reflect it, I get S alpha of V. The distance is the same, distance to the origin, the length of the vector hasn't changed, but this angle is now R two alpha minus theta. So 
what are the what are the coordinates of this vector in rectangular coordinates? This is going to be r cosine theta r sine theta. What are the coordinates of this vector? The rectangular coordinates. It's going to be r cosine of two alpha minus theta, r sine of two alpha minus theta. What is that? So we have double angle formulas. Cosine of two alpha minus theta is cosine two alpha cosine theta plus sine two alpha sine theta. And the sine of two alpha minus theta is sine two alpha cosine theta minus cosine two alpha sine theta. So this is equal to, let's see, r, so r times this multiplied by r. r cosine theta is x. This is x sine two alpha minus y cosine two alpha. And this, if I multiply by r, is x cosine two alpha plus y sine two alpha. So this is all done very neatly in the notes, so I'm sorry if this is sort of illegible. So s alpha of x, y is going to be x cosine two alpha plus y sine two alpha, x sine two alpha minus y cosine two alpha. That's the vector, the matrix cosine two alpha, sine two alpha, sine two alpha minus cosine two alpha. So the matrix for reflection is given by this matrix. And the determinant of this is minus cosine squared two alpha minus sine squared two alpha is minus one. So these are two fundamental examples of linear transformations in the plane, a rotation around the origin by alpha radians that has a matrix which has determinant one and reflection through a line through the origin in the plane and that has determinant minus one. So these are important linear transformations to know. And that's it for today.